Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, today we're going to look at automating the software deployment lifecycle with Chocolatey, Jenkins and PowerShell. So in this session today we're going to learn first of all what Chocolatey is. So we're going to do a, a kind of brief overview of what Chocolatey is. Uh, we're going to understand the Chocolatey recommended uh, organizational architecture as well. We're going to learn how to automate package internalization with the tools that we're going to go over today. But just a little bit of history on this talk itself. It's actually based on a blog post and also based on a workshop that myself and Gary Park from Chocolatey did uh, in WinOps last year and also at Chocolatey Fest last year as well. So the blog post was written by a friend uh, who no longer has a blog, so he's given me kind permission to put that on there. So that gives you a little bit of history uh, of that as well. So I recommend you check out that blog post. <coughs> So this flag is uh, on the screen for two reasons, and I don't think he's here, but one of the reasons is to annoy Rob Zool, uh, who I don't think is here. Uh, the second reason is I'm from Scotland, and we tend to talk very fast. So if I am talking too fast, I know a lot of people here, uh, your first language isn't English. Please just kind of put your hand up, get me to slow down a little bit. Okay. So before we start... Already? Volume? Can we put the volume up a bit? A bit louder? That better? Oh, well, I just speak louder. Scream, okay. Like this? Yeah. Better? Okay, good. No? Yeah. Okay, we'll carry on. At the back, can you hear me okay? Yeah, awesome. Okay, before we start, I just really want to show a hand. Uh, first of all, who has used chocolate or knows what chocolate is all about? Okay, that's a fair few of you. What about chocolate for business? Okay. Uh, chocolate for business is what we, you would need to uh, go through the, the automation pipeline we're going to look at today. So we'll cover that a little bit more. And also Jenkins, who knows what that is or has used Jenkins as well? Okay, so a fair few as well. Okay. So that allows me to kind of pitch uh, what I'm going to sort of uh, speed over and what I can uh, keep talking about. So what's Chocolatey first of all? Now Chocolatey is a package manager for Windows. So if you've ever used Linux, if you've ever used AppGet, Yum, Pacman and the other 40 million package managers that are part of the Linux ecosystem, um, you'll know that how integral they are to the operating system. Um, Macs as well use Homebrew. There was nothing traditionally for Windows. Um, so that's where Chocolatey was born from. So Chocolatey is effectively AppGet, Yum, all those other ones, and Homebrew for Windows. Uh, traditionally, as, as Windows people, we would download an installer, click next, 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 and keep going, and then click finish, and we'd have the software installed. Um, you, you would then have to do the same thing if you're actually going to upgrade the software as well. So Chocolatey can do that with two commands. Choco install, if we're going to do Google Chrome, let's say. Choco install Google Chrome, it'll download and it'll install that for you. And if you're going to upgrade it, Choco upgrade Google Chrome as well. So you could schedule that in the background and let it run every day or so. And it will actually update when uh, there are updates for Google Chrome available. <clears throat> now, because it saves us so much time, because it saves um, so many headaches, and because we can automate all this software installation, particularly on bare machines as well, it's really good for that. Um, we kind of think of it a bit like magic, especially in the Windows ecosystem. If you're on Macs, you're probably going to uh, Linux, the same thing. You've had that for a long, long time. On Windows, we have not had that. So there's two tenets of uh, chocolate that are really important to understand. <clears throat> Excuse me. And it's that chocolate manages packages and packages manage installers. Uh, Chocolatey does not manage installers. So in the Google Chrome's case, Chocolatey would manage the Google Chrome package, uh, and the Google Chrome package would manage the Google Chrome installer. Chocolatey will not manage the Google Chrome installer. That's not what it's there for. It's there to manage the package. So it's a, it's a distinction, a bit of uh, uh, something that, that is kind of missed quite a lot of the time. So Chocolatey package sources, um, really to understand where packages come from. This is um, where uh, you're, you're going to get the chocolatey and the chocolatey.licensed sources um, that you get out of the box with. Chocolatey free and open source, and you get it uh, with the, the commercial edition as well. So the free and open source version comes with a source called chocolatey out of the box. And that source is the chocolatey community repository. So if you go to chocolatey.org slash packages, and you see all the packages on there. Uh, the last time I looked, which was a little while ago, uh, it was 6,500 unique packages on there. 
um, and a total of about 65,000 versions of those packages in total. So you get access to all of them use it from the chocolatey source itself. If you have a licensed version of chocolatey, uh, you will have the chocolatey.license source. And what that does is it caches the installers uh, for uh, many, many, most of the vast majority of packages. So, for example, using Google Chrome again, as I'll keep using that as an example, if you want to install a very old version of Google Chrome and you have the license edition, that version may not be available to download. But if it's, uh, there was a package created at the time, then it should be available on chocolatey.license and you should still be able to install that. So that's what that is for. But the important part for our demo today is being able to add your own sources. Um, so we recommend that if you're going to use a repository manager, and that's something that will uh, manage your packages for you, uh, we would suggest you use Artifactory, Nexus, or ProGet. Now, the reason for that is because that's what our customers tend to use more than anything else. Um, and that's, therefore, the ones that, that we tend to use and we, we know works well with. But there are many other package managers out there um, that you could use instead. But a local folder can also be used as a chocolatey source. Um, the demos that I've, I've built today and that I use for all my Vagrant machines, uh, they actually have a folder on my laptop that has all the packages for there to be built. So when I spin up a Vagrant machine, I don't have to download all of them from a chocolatey community repository. So it saves a huge amount of time and a huge amount of bandwidth as well, especially if you're working from like a hotel, as we're doing just now, or a conference venue where the, the Wi-Fi is kind of limited. <coughs> Uh, so uh, yeah, so that, that's what we could, the, the chocolatey sources are for. So we're going to actually look at some chocolatey sources. Sorry, I'm actually checking that the Wi-Fi on my phone is working. I'm not checking text messages. So I've got um, a virtual machine up here and running. Just to let you know as well that I've had all sorts of problems zooming text in and all sorts with these virtual machines, so I'm hoping that everybody clicking it back can see them. Unfortunately, there's not much more I can do that I've tried, but we'll, we'll, we'll uh, see how we get on. So we'll have a look at the sources that are uh, on this machine. Actually, what I'm going to do, give me just a second, that's not worked properly. There we go. Apologies for that. So there we go, I'm just going to lift that up. So at the bottom here, you can see our, hopefully you can see the sources. I'm going to highlight them. There's a local one that I talked about, um, and that's uh, the source for that. The source of the packages for that is C colon backslash packages. Um, so that's inside the virtual machine. We've got a folder there linked to my, uh, my laptop. And then we've got the chocolatey.licensed source as well that we discussed earlier on. So that comes with the business edition out of the box. So we're going to have a quick look at this. I'm hoping this actually shows up because of the uh, resolution. It's probably quite small for the back. I'm just showing you basically the packages um, that are in that local C packages folder there. So they're all just new packages or nut kegs as some people call them. So we've actually set up a test repository and a production repository on this machine, and we'll go into that in more detail as we go on. But I'm just going to add them onto the machine and then have a look. <coughs> We've got problems already. Ah, I know what's wrong. Bear with me while I sort this out. There we go. <coughs> And that's the test repository I did. I'll show you that in just a second. And there we go. That's the production repository I did as well. And we're just going to have a look at them and show you that they've been added in. So there we go. That's us added in these other repositories. Again, we've still got the local one. We've got the chocolatey dot license we had previously, and we've now got a uh, test repository and the production repository as well. So 
So just to show you that there's nothing on those repositories, so later on, when we go and start doing any work, it's not smoke and mirrors, that things have just appeared. No packages found in test, none in production. So we'll jump back to the slides. There's about 60% slides in this, and about, uh, sorry, about 40% slides and 60% demo. So internalizing packages, and why would you want to internalize a package? And what is package internalization itself? So package internalization is the process of taking all of the resources that are required by a package and putting them into the package itself. So if you go to download, again, a Google Chrome is an example. If you go and download to install Google Chrome from a chocolatey community repository, what happens is you download the package from chocolatey community repository, and that package contains metadata, and it contains chocolatey scripts. Uh, per, sorry, chocolatey PowerShell scripts that tell chocolatey how to install, uninstall, and do other things with the installer. But the instructions for uh, PowerShell instructions for Google Chrome, for example, tells it to go away, download the Google Chrome installer from Google, bring it down onto your machine, and then tells it how to install it. So if you give uh, somebody that package, a, you know, a, a way to, for them to install that package is not portable because they then have to download that installer as well. Um, so what we what we want to do is, as a uh, part of the package internalization, is bring all that together into the package itself, so that that is portable. You can give it to somebody else. They might not have internet access, for example, or your machines might be segregated on a different network, but they can still install Google Chrome or any other type of package. But you do need Chocolatey for Business to do it automatically. <clears throat> Uh, you can manually uh, internalize packages. You can change the code, download the installer, and do it all yourself. However, the Chocolate for Business uh, package internalization does that all automatically for you. And in the pipeline that we're going to look at today, it has to be done automatically. It can't stop, wait for you, and then continue. So you would need Chocolate for Business to do that. Now, the other reason why you would internalize packages is um, we recommend that organizations disable the default sources. The ones we talked about at the beginning, the chocolatey and the chocolatey.license sources, we recommend you disable them for uh, your, the vast majority of your nodes. Your package internalization node would be different. Obviously, it has to reach out to the chocolatey community repository. But all the other nodes, we recommend you disable the default sources. And the reasons there, we've got four reasons behind this. Reliability being the first one. Uh, the chocolate community repository, and again, using Google Chrome, the, the install location for that is not controllable by you or your organization. So that Google Chrome installer could go away, change version, they might change location of it. Um, the chocolate community repository is subject to maintenance, and it's a normal website on the internet as well. So um, the, you know, these things are not within your control. When you're installing packages, if you've got a thousand nodes and you suddenly decide to install Google Chrome and you don't have the chocolate community repository available or the Google Chrome installer location, they're all going to fail. So you want to have control of that and you want to bring it within your organization. So that's the first reason is reliability. Trust is another. I maintain packages as a volunteer uh, on the chocolate community repository uh, way before I started working for chocolate. Um, I, Chrissy was talking about the DBA tools uh, package, uh, sorry, software on uh, Tuesday. If anybody was there, I maintain the DB Tools chocolate package for that. Uh, DB Checks, another one, and a whole host of others too. But you don't know me. Your organisation doesn't know me, you, and therefore you can't trust me. You can't trust the contents of that package without going through some sort of process within your organisation. And every organisation would be different to, as to what they would accept as a standard for a package. So that's another reason why you would bring it in-house, so that you can have that package uh, standard across your organisation. The third one is bandwidth. Um, if you've got, again, got a thousand nodes downloading a thousand times Google Chrome installer, you're downloading it from Google. Uh, you're also downloading a thousand packages from Chocolate Community Repository. That's um, going to be quite intensive on your network, where you might pay for your internet bandwidth by gigabyte or terabyte, it might even be free, it doesn't matter, you're actually going to, you're going to saturate your, your internet connection downloading something a thousand times that you really, really don't have to. If you bring it internal, it gets downloaded once from the internet, gets internalized, and then your nodes will be able to uh, take the package from one central location in your organization that you control. And finally, we've got copyright restrictions as well. Because Chocolate Community Repository is a public resource, 
Um, Google would understandably be upset if we packaged their installer and popped it inside a package. If we wanted to do the same with Microsoft Office, for example, Microsoft would understandably be upset as well. We have no distribution rights for that software, so therefore we have to download the installers at runtime, which is why the packages are so small from Chocolate Community Repository, because they only contain the instructions, PowerShell files, and the metadata itself and how to install a package, and then you have to download the actual payload, the, the installer, from somewhere else. As an organisation, you don't have those issues. You can bundle those packages, uh, sorry, those installers into that package and be able to distribute it to your nodes without any issue. <clears throat> but the, 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 one of the important ones as well is the default chocolate source that comes out of the box with uh, the free and open source version and also the commercial version um, is subject to rate limiting and excessive download limiting. Um, now, these have been put in place primarily because uh, organisations were uh, using Chocolate Community Repository, which is a free resource um, for the, as their main uh, resource. So they were downloading, as I said, a thousand nodes, a thousand times Google Chrome, that was happening. And it was causing issues with stability with the website. Um, so what uh, was put in place about last October, November was rate limiting. And what rate limiting does is it will actually block the IP address that's downloading for an hour, if that IP address downloads chocolatey more than five times in a minute, or uh, any other kind of package 20 times in a minute. That's on the website, that's not a secret. Um, the, the reason, as I said, the reason behind that was because that the chocolate community repository is for the many, not for the few. So we can't have the few uh, affecting it for everybody else. So that was put in place and it's actually increased the stability of the website substantially. We've also had excessive download limiting for quite some time. And what that is, uh, it's very similar to rate limiting in that it blocks uh, a particular IP address. However, that block is permanent um, until the organisation contacts us. So again, the, it's to really uh, looking at IP addresses, in this case probably organisations, that are uh, excessively downloading from a chocolate community repository. So over a period of time, if that IP address has downloaded tens of thousands of packages, there's, there is a limit. Um, tens of thousands of packages, then we will actively block that until that organisation contacts us and we can talk about the best ways for that internalisation or even caching to happen within the organisation. Again, it's designed to maintain the stability of the website. It's not designed for, uh, to encourage people to buy commercial licences because even if you have the commercial licence, these rate limits apply. It doesn't affect everybody, not just uh, free and open source people. So the automated internalization process that Chocolate for Business does uh, will actually internalize the vast majority of packages. We'll have a look at that in a second. The, the ones that are an exception to that rule happen to be Oracle packages. There are probably one or two others, but the, most of the Oracle packages, you're laughing at I, I know, um, are, are problematic. If anybody's worked with you know, the, the new versions of uh, Java that require licenses and jumped through the hoops to download various Oracle products, you'll understand why. Um, to actually get that downloaded programmatically, um, is, is quite difficult. And if you look at the actual uh, chocolatey packages for something like Java, um, you'll see the, the amount of code that's in there in order to jump through all those hoops. The chocolatey for business automatic and, uh, package internalizer can't jump through those hoops. It's too much. Um, so it doesn't do the Oracle packages. It does the vast majority of other packages. Um, and it will do them uh, within about five to 10 seconds, depending on how big the, the installer that it's downloading is. So it's incredibly fast, a lot faster than we could do it manually. Yes? Have, um, have Oracle been approached? Have, uh, have Oracle been approached, has uh, been the question? Um, no, as far as I'm aware. Uh, because the, the packages are maintained by uh, volunteer maintainers, that would be up to them to contact Oracle. So it, actually, I, I've said no. It could be the case that they have been. No that I know about. I don't know um, that, that anybody has contacted. But um, the other uh, aspect of automatic internalization is, as we mentioned, the Chocolate Community Repository uh, contains 6,500 packages um, and about 6 and uh, 65,000 versions of those packages. So that's a huge amount of code, it's a huge amount of skill, it's a huge amount of time that those maintainers have put in to keeping those packages uh, up to date um, and keeping them actually running with the changes that people like Oracle can make. Um, to the back end of where the installers come from. So you don't really want to put that time in there. So the automatic uh, package internalization allows you not to reinvent the wheel. It allows you to take those packages down. Now, once you've had a look at them, you trust the code in there, 
you can then internalise them um, and, as I said, utilise their skill, resources and the time that other people have put in there. But it also allows us to do automation. Um, and that's one of the important, most important things, especially for us today when we're going to be looking at. So we're going to look quickly at package internalisation. We're going to look at um, the contents of a very simple package and then we're going to internalise it. So we're going to, going to excuse me, can't speak. We're going to download a package called uh, Launchy, and we're going to look at the code. Ah, okay. Okay, we were going to look at that. Yeah, but it's not downloaded, that's the thing. That's not force, it's dash dash force. You would think the number of times I've actually practiced this and it's all went flawlessly and then it comes to the actual time and it fails. There we go. So it's downloading Launchy and we're just going to have a look at the code for Launchy. And it's not there. Launchy actually has is uh, what we're going to look at was the new spec file, which is the metadata that it, uh, is actually contained in the Launchy package itself. Um, and that gives us things like the ID, description, um, the version of Launchy as well. But it also contains, as I mentioned earlier on, the PowerShell script files that allows um, the, the Chocolatey to manage uh, that, that installer, manage Launchy itself. And when we're doing the automatic uh, package internalization, what that does is it'll actually download that, that um, installer, it puts it inside the package, and it changes the PowerShell script code as well to say, don't go and download it anymore, just do it within the package itself. So I'm doubt this is actually going to work either, but we'll have a look and see if that's going to download. I know what's wrong. There it's there. Right. So there's the launch sheet we downloaded. That was the metadata file I was talking about. Um, as I said, it's got the ID version in there. We're not going to spend too much time on that. But uh, the important part that we were going to look at was this. Install chocolate package is a chocolate uh, helper, PowerShell helper that uh, chocolate provide. And what we give that is the package name, um, the type of uh, installer it is, in this case it's an executable. Uh, we give it some switches, and we tell it where the actual binary uh, download, uh, sorry, binary installer comes from. And in this case, it's the website for Launchy. So that's, that's the, 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 the package as it exists now. So we're going to look at the internalized version of that. Uh, the new spec file, the metadata, hasn't changed. But we've actually changed the install file. So again, we've still got the name of the package, the type of executable, the, script, the, the switches. Uh, the important bit here is this. It's actually given the location of the downloaded uh, installer, and it's inside the files folder, and there it's there. Um, 
So that's how the package, the automatic package internalization works. It, as I said, it the virtual. I don't think it's me. I'm not doing anything. Sure. Is that better? Hey. So let's get back to our, uh, our code. Awesome. So we've had a look at internalizing a package and how quickly the automatic package internalizer does that. So we're going to jump back to some slides. Sure. Uh, you can keep them separate. Um, sorry. Yeah. Can. Yeah. If you uh, internalize a package, can you separate out the MSI or the executable so that you could store it elsewhere? Yeah, you can do that as well. So you can have, um, you can have a, I think they're called binary repositories. You generally can store files in there. You could store it in a folder. So yeah, you can split it off so that um, the, 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 the whole thing is not within the package. However, um, you're still internalizing it within your organization. So it can still, you're still not subject to all those issues you would have downloading one from the community repository and the binary installer from somewhere else. So yeah, you can do that. So chocolatey recommended organizational architecture. This is something we've put together um, for organizations to use as a kind of template. We understand that, as I've put there, every organization is a little snowflake, so you don't have to use um, all of it. But it gives you an idea of uh, what, what we recommend that you use. Um, now, the next couple of slides are also in white, so I'm not sure if it's going to blind anybody, but let's, let's go. Um, this is what we're looking at here. So as you can see in the top right-hand corner, we're downloading from a chocolate community repository. We've also got the binary uh, download locations for the installers, etc. And then it comes down into the package internalizer, and we've got the other bits. But the important bits for us are actually these bits, and this is what we're going to be looking at today. So as I said, you're going to download your bits and pieces from your chocolate community repository and the download locations, bring them into the package internalizer, push it to test, then on to production. And that's what we're actually going to do with Jenkins. So we've got three sort of steps, internalization, testing and deployment production. In order to do this, we have uh, we need package repositories. So we need, uh, in this case, chocolate server is what we're using. Now, we don't recommend you use this unless your requirement's incredibly simple. For the demo purposes today, it's absolutely ideal. But it's, uh, it's not called a simple server for nothing. That's the other name it's known by. So we would actually recommend, as I said earlier, Artifactory, Nexus, or ProGet. Uh, we're also going to use, uh, to kind of glue it all together, we're going to use PowerShell. What else would we use, of course? And we're going to use Jenkins for our automation. Now, we've got three Jenkins jobs set up. Um, for me to show you the code within Jenkins itself, 
It just doesn't work properly in this kind of environment. So I'm going to run over these really quickly. The important thing to bear in mind for the actual code that you've got is that it's effectively wrappers around some PowerShell scripts. That's, that's all that's really doing. If you look at the top section of this, and I'm not going to go over it, as I said, in any detail, we're creating a temp folder. We're running an internal choco, internalized dash choco package script. And then once that um, package is internalized with that script, if there's no problems with it in the last section down at the bottom, we're actually pushing it onto our test repository. So the next Jenkins job, uh, the code for that, again, is just simply a wrapper around update dash prod repo from test. That's the PowerShell script that's there. Okay. And the final one, what this final one does is it will actually look at the test repository we're going to look, we're going to spend some time on, and it will go and compare the contents of that with the chocolatey community repository. If there's any updated packages, it will then bring them down and push them to the test repository. So that's all that script does. And we're going to have a look at the scripts um, as we go forward. So this is the kind of configuration we're looking at. If you remember, we looked at the recommended uh, architecture. This is what we've actually set up. So we've got the binary installer downloads locations. Um, we've also got the chocolatey community repository. So we're taking our, our packages and we're taking our installers from there. We're then running it through the job called internalize package and push to test repo. It does basically what it says. It internalizes the package and pushes to the test repository. Once it's in the test repository, there's another job that's going to start, and what that's going to do is test the package. Now, we've got down at the bottom, test environment, maybe. You might have a test environment set up that you want to use. In this case, what we're doing today is we're going to just run it through some tester tests, and we're going to install it and uninstall it um, from a virtual machine, if everything works. Um, and that will then push that to the production repository, and from there, um, you've got your production environment, and you can deploy it to your thousand nodes, as we said. So we're going to look at the PowerShell scripts, and we're going to look at some common scenarios as well. So here's the, the scripts on the left-hand side that we're looking at. The first one we mentioned, uh, we talked about was internal, internalized, sorry, dash choco package. So we'll have a look at that one first. Is that okay for everybody? Is the right size? Everybody can see it all right? Yeah, cool. I'll get rid of this. We don't need that just now. Um, again, the, the code and the slides are all available, so I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time with this. Um, I'm just going to kind of gloss over what it does. So this is all just kind of set up at the top there for what it's going to do. But what it does is it effectively uh, downloads and uh, downloads the package and internalizes it within this script itself. So you give it a parameter of package names and it'll go away and download from a chocolate community repository um, and actually internalize those, internalize those packages and put them into a particular directory. That's all of that, all that does. And if you remember to the first Jenkins job, we had a little bit at the bottom that was different. It was pushing uh, packages to the, the test repository. It's going to push them from the directory that this stores the packages in. So this will run, internalize the packages into a folder the Jenkins job then does the other bit by pushing it to the test repository. The second one we had a quick look at was update prod repo from test. Again, what this does is it uses this uh, particular script uh, here that dot sources it in. We'll have a look at that in a minute. But what that effectively does is it will look at the uh, packages that exist in a repository and it will convert them into chocolatey objects. And the, uh, we get the name of the package and we get the version. That's, that's what we need uh, to be able to uh, manipulate those uh, packages within PowerShell itself. Um, and what it does then is it will actually test the package down here. We've got invoke pester. And it runs this test package script with a couple of parameters, and that's the package name and the path. And we'll come to look at that test package script uh, in a minute. If it fails, and um, then it's, it bombs out. If it continues, it will then push them on to the production repository because they've been tested. Everybody's happy. It goes on to the production repository. And we'll look at that test package quickly. So these are just uh, very simple PESTA tests. You probably want to have more robust ones, but this is just a demonstration of what can be done. And so we're just checking, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> We're just checking that it's a val valid uh, new package, and a new package is effectively a zip file. So we're just checking that the zip file is uh, not corrupt and it's okay. 
on the second bit there. We're just uh, checking it's got one new spec file and checking it's valid XML. New spec content is just XML. Uh, down here, what it is doing is it's actually installing and uninstalling it onto a virtual machine I've got running here. Um, and just making sure, as I said, that, that that happens and there's no errors. And then once it passes, it passes all these, these tests. And it'll be pushed to production. Uh, finally, we've got this get updated package. Now, this is the one that looks at the test repository. And it'll compare the versions in the test repository with what's available in the chocolate community repository. And if there's any updated versions, it will push them through the pipeline. It'll download them, internalize them, push them to test, test it, push it to production. And finally is the, that script there that I talked about. And what this does is it takes the output from Chuckle list, gets all the packages from a particular source, and converts it into a chocolatey, uh, sorry, PowerShell object um, that's got package name and version in there. That's all that does. So as I said, the slides and the code will be available so you can dig into that in more detail at your leisure. So we're going to have a few scenarios we're going to run through. Um, if anybody's kind of working with this, anybody's working with Chocolate A, you'll get requests for packages every now and again. So the devs have requested that we install, uh, sorry, the devs have requested that we make available uh, OpenSSH. So that's what we're going to do. So we're just going to check that there's nothing there. So then we come to actually put something there. You can see it. We're then going to go, and fingers crossed it works. We're going to actually run this internalized package and push to test repo. I'm going to build it with parameters. And we're going to, the parameter we're actually going to put in is OpenSSH because that is the package that we want to download from a chocolate community repository. So I'm hoping that is OK for everybody to see. So what it's doing at the moment is it's internalizing that package, but it's downloading it, and that's the spinning wheel. So it's found it, it's recompiled it, and it's pushed it uh, onto the test repository. So it's then triggered a new job, which will test that package and push it to production. So that's downloaded it from a test repository. It's run these pester tests here. Those three basic pester tests that we talked about. Now what it's doing is it's installing uh, OpenSSH onto a virtual machine that's running on here. And now it's going to uninstall it as well. So the package installed in 8.09 seconds. And it's uninstalled in seven, just over seven seconds. And that's it. So that's it pushed from internalized, pushed it to test, tested it, and pushed it to production repository. So it's now available for your nodes to install. So if they have a look at the contents of those repositories, there we can see OpenSSH 7.9.01 is available on both test and production. So we're now, this is just a, a, a node. This is your devs machine, if you like. Um, and we're going to run chocolatey GUI on this, mainly just to show you that there's something else except the command line, something at least a bit prettier. So on this PC, we've got all these uh, packages installed. But if we go and look at the production repository, we expect to see OpenSSH. So if we refresh that, OpenSSH is there. So we right click, install. takes a few seconds, and then that package will be installed on that machine. So that's your dev now saying, hey, that package is available. I'm going to install that on my machine. And that's it done. So if we go back to see the packages on this machine, and we refresh, actually, we don't have to refresh it. There, it's there. OK. So that's one scenario you would use. So the dev team have caught with uh, a new app that they want deployed 
um, out to machines or make it available, should I say, for uh, machines um, in your uh, organization. So what they've done is they've actually built it, but within their build script, which I'm going to mimic here, they have uh, compiled the package, built the package, uh, they've pushed it to your test repository, and what they've also done is um, invoke a webhook to uh, kick off the chocolatey, uh, sorry, the Jenkins job that will test the package and push it to your production repository. So I'm just going to run that just now. And that didn't work. Yeah, it's always the same. There's a build script there, so we're just going to run that. There we go. So that's, uh, as I said, that's created that package, pushed it to your test repository, and then they've kicked off that job through a webhook. And um, we're going to have a look at that. There we go. You see that job's running just now, so we'll just click on that, and then it's there. So what that job does, again, to repeat what I've said, it runs those Pestle tests, installs it, uninstalls it, and if it's happy, it pushes it to production repository, which makes it available to all your nodes. Package is pushed successfully, and it's finished with success. So if we go back again onto the dev machine, or that could be anybody's machine, and have a look here in the production repository, we just refresh it. There we go, we've got the package daisy suddenly available. It wasn't available before. If we install that, we've got the tech bottom right hand corner. Say it's installed. Go onto a PC. Uh, sorry, yeah, the packages for a PC. And we've got there the Daisy install package that's just been installed. So we've got one final scenario, and this actually happened. Uh, And that is that 7-Zip had a security vulnerability. It's not these particular versions. I've just put these versions on. Um, so we're going to set this up. Let me get errors again. Let's have a look at the packages that are not there. As I said, the number of times I rehearsed this, and there was no problems. No, okay. We're going to skip that one. But what that would have done is uh, that sets it up for 7-zip uh, version 18.6. And then we're going to look at and say that, well, that had a security vulnerability. So what we would then have done is we'd actually have updated, we'd run, sorry, this job, which is the only one we hadn't run, and that is upgrade outdated packages in the test repository. And what that would have done is it would have looked at the versions of the packages in the test repository, and it would have found 7-zip version 18.6. And they said, well, the Chocolatey Community Repository has version 19 available. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to download that for you. I'm going to internalize that. I'm going to push it to the test repository. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to test that, make sure it's all OK, using those pester tests and installing that onto the virtual machine to make sure it's installed and uninstalled. And then what it would have done was push that to production. And then what I would have done is I went onto that dev machine again and seen that we'd had an updated package for 7-Zip. 
um, and then we would have installed it. So that's how you would get around that kind of security vulnerability for any kind of package, as you would, uh, in this case, we would have taken the up-to-date version from a chocolate community repository, but that could have been from anywhere. Yeah. What about versions of the package, not versions of the software? Uh, the question was, we're talking about versions of the package or versions of the software. Now, on the chocolate community repository, we uh, strongly stick to the version of the package should match the version of the software. In an organisation, you might not do that. But if we put that aside, then when I talk about a version of a package, I actually mean the version of the software as well. Uh, that's a question because you mentioned chocolate repository is one place you can get our version. That's right. So if you upgrade, then you will upgrade your old version to whatever is current. That's right, yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Uh, so, yeah, so that would have uh, internalized that, pushed it test, production, blah, blah, and then you would have got onto the dev machine and you would have been able to update that. And we'd have seen that process going through. Unfortunately, the demo gods are not with me today. Um, so that, that hasn't worked, but that, that's the process we would have followed. That's the process you would generally follow for that. So you'd probably schedule that, that job itself and maybe run it every day, every week, every month, whenever you feel that it would be appropriate to do so, yeah. The, the question is, how would we compare the versions of the packages available on our internal repository within an organization uh, against the chocolate community repository or whatever we're using as a kind of upstream? And what we're doing here is we're using PowerShell to do that. That script I showed you, uh, convert to choco object. Um, that's what I'm using here. And what that does is it will look at the packages that are in your internal repository. It will convert the, 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 the information that Chocolate gives it back, the name and the version, into a Chocolate object. And then we do the same uh, with uh, the community repository to get back the, the different versions of the packages. And then we'd see if the community repository's got a higher version, then we'd know we need to upgrade. If it's got the same version, we don't need to worry about it. There's no update available. So we're doing that within PowerShell itself. So that's, uh, Chocolatey will give you that information, but you have to do the work to compare them. So we'll jump back and we'll just finish uh, some of the, the slides that are left. So ideas to extend and customize this. Now, this is a very basic uh, setup that we've done today, and it's there primarily to give you an idea of what you can do. It's not there uh, to say this is the, the fantastic solution that you must use. Um, it allows you to build on it and take bits and pieces out of it, just as you could do with the organizational architecture itself. So a few ideas just to extend and customize it. You'll probably have your own. And as I mentioned, schedule updating packages from the Chocolatey Community Repository. Um, so you, as I said, you would only do that every day, every week, every month, whatever your organization feels. You would want to write your own pester test. The pester test we've written today, very, very simple tests. Um, we installed it onto a virtual machine and uninstalled it as well and used that within Pester. And if you um, actually submit packages to the Chocolate Community Repository, that's what it does. Um, it will actually install and uninstall your package on a different version of Windows, etc. But the, the process is the same. Um, so you would want to write your own Pester test for your organization. And when packages are published to production, you would probably want to send the team that manages this some sort of message to say, hey, there's an update um, available. And uh, you would want to be able to send out my email, Slack, Teams, Getter, whatever you guys use. But you probably want to alert them to that. And there are probably a number of other ones as well. These are the ones that, again, very simple, the way you want to update that. So in summary, what we've kind of learned today is what chocolate is and how sources work. Uh, we understood that, well, we hopefully understood the package internalization and why it's important for organizations to do it, um, particularly with regards to the kind of four options that we had, why we uh, asked you to uh, disable the default sources. Excuse me. Uh, and how to apply the automation to the t uh, chocolate eight package internalization process that didn't unfortunately fully work for us today. Um, and how you would deploy that to your nodes at the end of the day as well. So the slides and the demo code um, are there, but I'm also going to take questions before I put up my final slide. Has anybody got any more questions?
Oh, the one they've developed. Yeah. Uh, from from their developed app, yeah, yeah. The question was, how would you create a, an internal package from the app that we we saw that was developed? So Daisy, a very very simple uh, app. Um, what they would do, they would they would put that into the build pipeline. So we had that build script there. Um, but the the process of actually creating it um, would be to uh, create the new spec file, which is the metadata we talked about, so the ID, uh, the version, uh, that kind of information. So they would have to create that themselves. Either they could script that to create it automatically because they would have a new version, so it would input a new version into that file. Um, the chocolatey install uh, PS1 file that we, we mentioned, there's also a thing called the chocolatey uninstall PS1 that is not needed in the majority of cases, but again, they could either create that programmatically by using a template and inserting the bits in there, um, or they could just handwrite it if it wasn't going to change. And then you would use the chuckle pack command. And what it will then do is take everything within those folders, um, that folder structure that you've given it within the new spec file, and it will create a, a, what's called a new package from that. Um, that new package is effectively a fancy zip file. It's a zip file with lots of other bits in it that, with information that it needs uh, as a new package. And that's effectively all they would do. To get it to, they would then push it to t the test repository as we had here. So as part of that build, um, they pushed that to the test repository. Um, and then finally, what they then did is they wanted it to go into production. So they, we invoked a webhook within Jenkins to say, I want to actually kick off the, the job that uh, took anything that's in test that isn't in production and test it and then put it into production. So that was the whole process that they had done. So the, the devs themselves, if you trust them, they could do that whole process. And at the end of the day, it would actually just land in the production repository. And they could uh, then install it, as we've seen from the chocolatey GUI, or you know your finance team, or your uh, HR department, wherever it's supposed to go, could then install it as well. Does that answer your question? Yeah, OK. Any other questions? Uh, the question was, can Chocolate for Business push uh, installations onto clients? Chocolate itself can't push onto clients, but we do have something called Chocolate Central Management, which has actually just been released, the, the very early version of it. And we're looking at towards the end of this year where you'll actually be able to deploy from that. So the very first version just now, what it does is it will gather statistics about your, your nodes. So it can show you the package that are installed and the ones that are outdated. That kind of information that you would need maybe for management to see, you know, the, the, the sort of uh, state of your, your clients. But in the, the future version, you'll, you'll be able to actually go in and say, this package here, I want to deploy into that group of nodes. And it will just go away and push them out. But at the moment, from the chocolate client, no, it can't do it. Yes. Yes, you can do it that way. Um, Box Starter tends to be, sorry, the question was, um, you can use Box Starter to deploy uh, packages onto uh, remote nodes. And yeah, you can do that. Box Starter tends to be used, though, for um, bringing up bare machines. And uh, well, what you would do is, you, let's say you've got a new laptop, for example. You want to install 20-odd packages on there. Some of them need reboots. .NET's going to be installed on there. Box Starter will be able to take a list of those packages and use Chocolatey to push the, sorry, install the packages onto that machine. And then if any of them need a reboot, it will reboot the machine and then continue the installation process. So it's particularly good for, developers use a huge number of packages. Um, so it's very good for that. They get a new machine, run Box Starter, go away, have a coffee or lunch or whatever come back and it can be done. But Box Starter could also be uh, used for that as well. Box Starter is a, a project um, from Chocolatey as well. It was actually originally written by Matt Rock, just to give you a little bit of history about it. Um, but Chocolatey now kind of uh, managed that project for them. And I'm actually the lead engineer on the, the Box Starter project. So you can find that under um, github.com slash chocolatey slash Box Starter or Box Starter.org. But yeah, that's a good question or a good point, should I say. In what way? Oh, do you mean sort of right-clicking? Um, yeah. It's, so again, you can. 
I'd still reiterate the question, sorry. It was that um, just to, the, the point was made that uh, chocolate for business can also create packages in other ways. So, for example, you could take a, an installer. Again, I'll use Google Chrome as the example. You can right-click on that using chocolate for business, and it'll actually uh, give you a little uh, package builder, and you can build the package for that. Uh, with that, and it'll build it automatically because it'll extract out uh, the information from the installer and how to do it silently, etc. And when it creates that package, if it can't do all of it, because sometimes, you know, there's, there's uh, a load of different install types out there, it'll actually give you a to-do list of things that it says, I can't do, can you do this, can you do that? Um, but for things like MSIs, it's really good for creating a package. Right-click on the MSI, and it'll actually create a package within, again, a few seconds. So that, that's a good point, yeah. You could do, so you could create a package that way, so that kind of answers that question as well if you wanted. The devs wouldn't do it that way, but if you wanted to create a package that way, um, then yeah, you could do it using the package builder. Anybody else? No? Okay. So if you like to talk, push the button on the way out. I have chocolatey t-shirts here. There are plenty of chocolatey stickers as well. Please come and get either or both. Uh, there's all my details, and thank you very much. If you get any more questions, come and see me at the break.